So let's take a peek behind the scenes for a minute to see how exactly things work when I create a variable like right over here, integer x. What exactly happens? Okay, so uh, here is your typical computer and like any typical computer it probably has all the typical hardware and systems needed to work like a regular computer. So it probably has the CPU and the video card and especially what we are going to look at right now is this piece right over here, this black and green piece called random access memory or RAM for short. Most of the time all of this stuff on your computer, your programs and your operating system like Windows or Mac is all stored away on this piece over here called the hard drive, your hard, dri hard disks. But that's just where everything gets stored away, away while it's sleeping, while it's not working. As soon as you turn on your computer and the big program Windows or Macintosh starts, or inside of Windows when you start a program like a game or one of your programs that you created, that's when everything gets loaded off the disk, off the hard drive, right over here into random access memory. Like in your C++ program, this is where all of your variables will get stored as they are created while the program is running. And as soon as the program finishes, of course, everything is unloaded, everything is taken off RAM. Let's take a closer look at how exactly it works when you create variables in RAM. This is of course just an illustration, it's not exactly how RAM looks like. So basically RAM is like a huge storage room with many 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 of these little cubby holes where you could store uh, stuff relevant to your program that's running. Nowadays that RAM doesn't cost so much. You would typically have millions and millions, maybe even billions of these uh, cubby holes available in your RAM for storage. Now the way memory is measured, as you probably already know, is by bytes. We have bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, etc. Usually every single one of these cubby holes can hold one single byte of memory. One cubby hole, one byte of memory. So when you create a variable in your C++ program, cubby holes right over here in RAM get filled up with the stuff necessary to keep your variable in memory. Depending on what compiler you're using, will depend on how much of these cubby holes will be used in memory. For example, on my compiler, when I create a integer variable, it uses up four bytes of memory in RAM. So that would mean that as soon as I create my integer x right over here in my C++ program, the program will right away reserve and fill up for me four bytes of memory, four of these cubicles here in RAM. Then let's say if I create another variable, uh, this time short, let's call it y, in my program, then on my compiler, since a short integer takes up two bytes of memory, then the program will right away reserve for me, it will fill up another two cubby holes, filled up with the necessary stuff for my short variable. Now as you've noticed right over here, each one of these cubby holes in memory has a label, a number on it, known as the memory address for this particular cubbyhole. Because of course RAM is so vast and has so many millions and millions of cubbyholes, we need to have a way of tracking down and finding exactly where are our variables, which cubbyhole are they stored in. And that is taken care of by our program, who keeps track of the memory addresses where our variables are stored, so that now every time in our program when we do something with our variable x or y, the program will know already where to look for our variable in memory and make the appropriate changes. Now if you think about it, what that means is that in my program, when I create a variable called x, the program has to take this variable name, whatever it is, x or y or whatever name I gave my variable, and sort of translate that into a memory location in RAM. So when I say x, the program knows that I'm talking about 00000 in memory. 
and when I say Y, the program knows that I'm talking about 00004 in memory. And that's convenient for us so that we don't have to worry about weird numbers of memory addresses in memory. The program will automatically take care of the address in memory. All we have to do is give a specific name to our variables and the program will take care of the rest. But with the side effect that the program will enforce the rules of scope. The rules of scope basically dictate that the name of a variable can only live for as long as that scope lives. So if I have integer x in my main function, that integer x will only live for as long as the main function lives. I can even have another integer x in another function somewhere else because it's in a different scope. Even though we know the rule that you can't have two variables with the same name in a valid piece of C++ code, however, of course, this is only within the same scope. If I have two different scopes, like this scope over here and this other scope over here, then they could have two variables with the same name. Because these two variables, integer x over here and integer x over here, are two different, com completely different variables, which have two completely different sets of bytes in memory, and thus they have two completely different addresses in memory. So I can ca call upon, I can start using this variable x in another scope or this variable x in a different scope because if you want to rely on the convenience of using variable names then the program will enforce the rules of scope and you can't use the same variable name in a different scope that doesn't know about that name. But of course don't forget that right over here in our main function when I create a variable x over here and give it zero and then I call this other function called do stuff and I go and I do whatever is over there while I am over there it's true that I cannot possibly access the variables of the main function scope because I am in a completely different scope nevertheless the variables of the main function scope are still living they still exist just because I am right now in a different scope doesn't mean that the variables of another scope disappeared they didn't disappear, they, they're still alive, they're still living, but they are not accessible because I am in a different scope. Only when a scope finishes, like when this function over here returns, when it's done doing everything that it's done, only then do all of its local variables get destroyed. But while a function is running and execution goes from one function to another function, all of the variables that we created so far without returning still exist. So while we are in this function do stuff, this variable integer x of the main function still exists. We just don't have any way of, ac of accessing it because it's a different scope. So when I'm in the main function and I create my integer x, and then as the function, as the main function goes on, I step into a different function, and over there I also create a integer x, then in that second function, when I say x, the compiler, the program will go to this variable x right over here. When I am in the main function and I say x, the program will go to this variable over here. The important thing to realize is that when I am in the main function and then I go to this other function, the variables I created in the calling function, in the main function, still exist because the calling function, the function where we came from, didn't finish yet, it didn't exit. So all of the variables that it created still exist. We just don't have a way of, ex of accessing it. Well, the truth is that in C++ we do have a way of accessing memory directly without using the variable name, but rather the variable address. That way, instead of letting the program handle the memory addresses and then not letting us access certain variables because of the rules of scope, we ourselves will dig into the address of our variables and as we will see that will help us access any variable we'd like in whatever level of scope we happen to be. That's right, even if I am inside function B, which has nothing to do with the scope of function A, I will still be able to permanently affect all of the variables in function A and avoid all of the restricting rules of scope.